Hi, I'm Tony Wolf. I'm writer and illustrator of Tales from the Wolf, a collection of all my short stories over the last 15 years. It's published by CosmicLionProductions.com. My website is TonyWolfActor.com. I'm on Instagram and Twitter, at TonyWolfness, and you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented, creative person. I've known him on social media more than I've known him for his work in acting. But he's coming today with not his acting resume, but his author resume, as well as a comic creator, and his memoir at that, Lots to dive into. Joined by the ever talented Tony Wolf, creator of Tales from the Wolf, which is an amazing title, by the way. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kurt. I'm so glad we we finally made this happen. We we wanted to do an interview for a long time, and uh, thank, thank you for sticking with me. <laughs> hey, you have a more busy schedule than I do, so you know I'm glad that you're putting coming together with such an amazing comic here. And let's dive into it right here and now. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Tony Wolf. I'm a writer, actor, and illustrator. And I grew up, like many of us did, uh, drawing and writing my own comics. And I wrote and drew my own comics throughout high school and college. <clears throat> and uh, as the years went on, I was like, I really want to focus on acting. And I'm still acting, but I'm not, uh, I haven't made quite as much headway as I would have liked by this point, but I'm still actually getting some good callbacks, I'm going relatively far in some big projects. I went to final callbacks and I was the uh, producer's, uh, casting director's selection for White House Plumbers, which is a new HBO miniseries. I was up for about four lines with Woody Harrelson and Justin Thoreau playing a White House attorney. Uh, anyway, the point of all this is the acting, I'm getting real close, but I haven't quite, you know, gotten the, you know, big, big stuff yet. Um, haven't had my big break yet. And so when I was around 40, I returned to this idea of writing and drawing my own comics. I don't typically write fiction. I wrote fiction as a kid, uh, as many of us did as well. I decided to go the autobio route very much influenced by Harvey Picar, uh, Dean Haspiel, so many great autobiographical cartoonists that I'd read through the years, Jeffrey Brown, Julia Wirtz, so many people. So essentially about 13 years ago, I started to write and draw and hand letter my own autobiographical comics, uh, largely first inspired by having lived in the same apartment in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, right next to Williamsburg, right before Williamsburg kind of blew up. And I began this series called Green Point of View, which was autobiographical short stories. And I knew that uh, I still have a day job and, you know, other commitments. So I knew short stories was a good form for me, a good format, because I knew I could execute a short story, write it and draw it in a handful of months. You know, I didn't want to tackle a 700 page or 300 page graphic novel. And I thought one day, I'll churn out enough short stories that I can compile them in a book. And over the years, first I did a series of Greenpoint stories. Then I began doing a series of comic stories about being a comics fan. I'd seen some of those years ago, sporadically done. And then I began doing stories about my favorite unique foods, which led to stories about food history which then led to stories about food in general. And that led to me doing four comics for the New York Times wow. in their food section. And I unwittingly stumbled into this niche. I've now kickstarted, not in the kickstarting sense, I unwittingly started a new section in the New York Times for food comics and many other people besides me. I did the first four. Then once I did several, other cartoonists, award-winning food writers, and professional illustrators began throwing their hats in the ring. And now I think there have been something like 11 
or 12 food comics in the pages of the New York Times. I feel like a proud father because now there's a whole new sporadic section of comics in the food section of the New York Times that did not exist until I unwittingly created this like little genre. You're a trailblazer. I didn't mean to. It worked out. And now I haven't pitched an idea to them in a while that they've gone for it because it's very hard to to find a food story, one of the rules is if it's been written about to death in the prose world, mm. like the magazine articles, regular journalism articles, they don't want to see a comic about it. If something's going to be a comic, it needs to have a visual element that's compelling, would be suitable for uh, a comic book story. But I've started to encourage, recommend, and vaguely mentor other cartoonists and recommend them. And now they're doing stuff for the New York Times. One friend of mine got me in, so now I'm trying to get other people in. If my stories are not uh, getting in, I want to bring some new talent, new cartoonists into the newspaper. It's the pay it forward mentality that uh, I think a lot of people in today's age don't really do because they just think that they're, they're the only ones that are going to do this and darn everyone else. As creatives and as human beings, I always try to come from a place of gratitude, appreciating what I've been given, appreciating whatever I've gotten, never forget where you came from kind of a thing. If my acting career someday takes off to the level that I envision, I want to keep that in mind as well. Don't forget where you came from because even the big people we know now, they were once aspiring just, just like we are. So the book is a collection of every short story I've done. And then I did some other short stories about other topics. I like to try to focus on whatever is inspiring me at the time. So there's four Greenpoint comics, there's four food comics, and then there's a series of comics about being a comics fan. Then there's some political cartoons and short essays. Then there's some other current events, short, story, short essays that are not about politics. And then there is a series of short random autobio stories that are just sort of cute, anecdotal, funny stories from my past that fall into no subgenre other than autobio. And those were largely inspired by, um, I don't know if you know who Noah Van Siver is, a pretty prominent and successful autobiographical cartoonist. Uh, he also does fiction stuff and he, he's illustrated. He illustrated a graphic novel about Abraham Lincoln, uh, his life story that someone else wrote. He's done so many things. Uh, and John Porcellino, was another influence. He's an indie cartoonist. He does a comic series called King Cat. Very big in the indie scene. Yeah. And it's partly autobio, partly fiction, mostly autobio, and some like illustrated poetry that he does. The book is a collection over the last 15 years because some of them I would occasionally do short stories for other writers before I began writing my own stuff. And I just wanted to pack it all in there. It's about 220 pages. So I was so thankful to uh, Cosmic Lion Productions, who is the uh, publisher that uh, has published the book, and to my colorist and original series production editor, Sir Griffin, Thomas Griffin, who originally published many of the books in mini comic form, several of the books, and colored, I would say, three quarters of the book itself, colored the cover. Uh, I still don't know how to color myself digitally. <laughs> So I, I have enlisted the work of several colorists, most prominently Thomas Griffin. And I'm just so happy to have a book now with a spine. It, it is a hefty book, that is safe to say. And I've only gotten through about a quarter of it, unfortunately, before our interview. There is just so much to touch on and, and talk about here. Sure. What's the most misunderstood aspect about the memoir genre that maybe people who don't follow it misunderstand? I always like to think of comics memoir should hopefully be similar-ish to prose memoir. Meaning, writing about one's everyday life is great. When I tackled it, I've read so much autobio over the years, uh, most of it comics, but also regular book books, as my wife teases me. I'm like, there's book books, and then there's comic books. The key, hopefully, is trying to either make the mundane interesting and dramatize the mundane, or when I was doing it, that I said to myself, I don't want it to be about my dating life when I was single because I don't think I had any good stories. You know, I was uh, single for a long time and I was unlucky in love for a long time. And 
I just thought if I've read a thousand stories about it before, whatever the topic is, I didn't want to tackle that. Already read so many stories about neurotic artists who went through depression or neurotic artists who had dating struggles or neurotic artists being neurotic. I thought to myself, if I were to tackle one of those issues, which I eventually did in a story about dealing with depression and anxiety, I really want to try to bring a new angle to it, or at least try not to duplicate so many of the memoir autobio stories I'd read and processed as a reader. I tried very hard to be a brutal editor on myself. If I tackled a story, I wanted to make sure I felt I had a new or what I thought was a new angle on it to the best of my ability. As far as comics autobio in general, I think it's a great genre. If you don't want to write fiction, you could tell stories from your everyday life. The key is, and the trick is, try to emphasize either what's funny about them or what's reflective about them. Letting the reader into your train of thought, letting the reader into your personal reflections, whether it's on society or your neighborhood or your family life. It's a fun genre. And the, the challenge for me as a writer and illustrator, but first and foremost as a writer, try not to repeat what I've already read. But I, I think that's a similar, right? If you're writing superhero stuff, which a lot of people are, which is great. I'm a huge superhero fan myself. You just try not to repeat what you've read before because we've all read so many things before by now, right? So I tried to take the angle of mixing autobio and history, whether it be of my neighborhood, of weird, unique foods. But I think that's one of the great things about the, the memoir genre is it's your playground. You can really make it whatever you want. Just make sure that it's compelling to the best of your ability. I would think to myself all the time, I would envision like a J. Jonas Jameson like editor or Perry White. Like, why would a reader care who doesn't know you? You know, why would a total stranger care about this? Because you know your friends and family are going to read the stuff that you create. I just kept thinking, where's Parker? Why would a reader who doesn't know you give a shit? You know, so I really tried very hard. And I thought of like my college English professors, but I tried very hard to make it compelling to a stranger. Why would a stranger care? And even if the stranger doesn't like the work, try to pack in some facts and history so that at least a reader comes away feeling they've learned a few little facts, a few little factoids, uh, something amusing. Even if you don't like the story, you've come away learning something. You have so many stories and so many different areas in this particular memoir. And it almost sounds like you could easily do a volume two on this. <laughs> well, I would love to. Uh, the main thing, as with a lot of indie creators, you know, is time. I probably put about eight hours a page into each page between the writing, the layouts, the penciling, inking that I love to do hand lettering. It's very time consuming, but I love to do it. Eventually I have to do what a lot of people do, which is create a computer font based on my hand lettering so that it looks organic. It doesn't look like a, a prefab font. I love it. I actually have a story here, which has fallen by the wayside. I'm gonna resume it about playing with uh, Star Wars figures as oh. a kid. Nice. Um, there's a little recreation here of the Chewbacca, <laughs> Chewbacca, the Wookiee, um, you know, the old Kenner boxes they used to come in. And the story mentions that when we first got the Yoda figure right before Empire Strikes Back came out, seeing my friend have the Yoda figure, <laughs> it was it blew our minds because we'd never you didn't even know what Yoda was at that time. You know, yeah. only the first movie had come out. And when my friend uh, said he saw this new action figure at a store, we just were mystified. You know, what is Yoda? What is this new character? Because Empire Strikes Back's release was several months away. One of the great things about being an indie creator, you're not employed by a big uh, corporate entity. You can write about whatever you want to write about. You know, so if I want to do a story about playing the Star Wars figures as a kid, that doesn't fit into a neat <laughs> genre, but I can do it. And currently, I'm illustrating a story uh, by a New York Times journalist, actually the guy who got me into the New York Times. His name is George Gustines, or Gustines, if you do the proper Latin American pronunciation. 
and he's writing a story about his days as a comics letter hack, meaning he wrote in to at least, uh, you know, 40 series or 50 series and had something like 38 or 40 letters published in Marvel, DC, independent books. Yeah. So we're doing a story. Uh, George wrote it. I'm illustrating it. And the story goes back and uh, talks to you about what started comic book letter columns. And you can trace back the origins of comic book letter columns to the science fiction magazines of the 1950s, which includes, that's how Ray Bradbury got his start. Ray Bradbury, the prominent science fiction writer, wrote in to these old, uh, you know, science fiction magazines, some of which I've drawn here, Startling Stories, Astounding Science Fiction, Science Fiction Quarterly. A lot of the writers that we know in the science fiction world back in the 1950s got their start by writing in to the letter columns in these science fiction short story collections, periodicals and magazines. Then once comic books really took off even more, they began to have more letter columns where readers, of course, would write in month to month and give a thumbs up or thumbs down to what was happening in the stories and give input, give feedback. So it's a story um, called I Was a Teenage Letter Hack. Uh, and it it traces, part of it is about George's uh, personal journey. And he started to make pen pal friendships from these letter columns, right? People he never met or eventually met years later, yeah. much like you can make a social media friend now through Twitter and Instagram or Facebook, and then you might meet them in person four years later after forming a friendship with them online. So George, uh, his personal life was very positively influenced by these friendships. That's what the story is about. But it also takes you through this world of, you know, kind of geeky stuff, uh, old covers of 1980s comics. Rob Liefeld, in his early days before he was a professional, illustrated uh, a Teen Titans fanzine called Titan Talk. Yeah. He, uh, illustrating an homage, recreating this cover of Jericho that Rob Liefeld did the original cover. So once this is all colored, um, we're going to, uh, you know, we tagged Rob Liefeld in a in my hand drawing of this, and he actually put it out on nice. Instagram to his millions of people, going, eh, "I remember drawing this when I was seventeen and you know? <laughs> um, and I've always I really love uh, drawing homages to the great comic book covers or illustrations. I love drawing on my own, but there's nothing like doing a good homage cover because it's so fun. The composition is already established for you as an artist. And it reminds me of, uh, in art school, painters and illustrators are often give, given the assignment to recreate a study of a famous classical painting by the masters. And so when I sit down to do any homage uh, covers or panels, I feel like I'm in art school recreating a classical painting mm -hmm. by the masters, you know, like an art student would. So I just, I just love it. And Although the book, uh, uh, someone could say that that my book, some a couple people were like, "Wow, there's like nine different kinds of stories in here. You, you really kind of go all over the place," yeah. which someone could take as a positive or a negative. But I like that. I like that um, a short story can be about anything, especially if you're in the autobio world. And I like doing stories about comics fandom, stories about being a comics fan um yeah that, so that, well yeah. that that's what's that's what's amazing is you know comics is is a worldwide phenomenon but it's also a way to connect with people no matter what background they're in whether they're if yes. they're super rich or whether they're you know a kid just growing up and finding their first comic whatever that may be like i grew up with web comics more than i grew up with dc and marvel so right right you know there's there's that type of independent creators where you see their their struggles as an artist if they're doing an autobiographical you see their their transition from indie to published in dc and marvel like years later they, the trajectory of people through comics whether it's as a reader or whether it's as a creator like yourself you know is just amazing to see you know how we enjoyed it and what our first comics were what we enjoyed 
Yeah. Your podcast, rather, started covering web comics primarily, yeah. right? Back in 2008, and I'll keep this brief because I've said this multiple times over the years. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in, it's interesting. In 2008, I, I started with no knowledge about how to do a podcast. I was helping a web comics database collect information. And I said to my friend Phil, we should create a podcast about this called Two Geeks Talking Web Comics. Yeah. He's like, sure, go ahead. So I did. No knowledge. Yeah. And for the first year, I think we did almost 300 episodes. And wow. they're not short episodes. They were two-hour episodes. There's a lot of old content I still have that I, I will be bringing back. But oh, wow. cool. that transitioned into doing video interviews at comic conventions. Then that transitioned into what we see here today. So I haven't changed. I've gotten older, but the amazing, talented people that I get to speak to are just so incredible, like yourself and like everyone I've had on the show. So the stories that you get to tell, not only through your works, but through our conversations is now immortalized until the internet crashes. So yeah, exactly right. Until so, it all comes tumbling down. Exactly. So let's enjoy it while we can, I think. And it's, yeah. it's amazing to see the journey that you've had. Have you ever thought of doing a, a comic or a short comic or have? You? No, I, I don't have the, the time for something like that. As a writer, sure. I, I would love to do maybe something right. like that. But I know the limits of my artistic style or lack okay. thereof. Okay. So what is an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, that's a good question. When language had power. I don't know that I have a specific experience, but even as a kid, I was always very fascinated with books and storytelling and language and the way a, a story can move you you know, even a, a book itself, a written book, can move us as readers. Also, as, a, as an actor, I was very influenced by, you know, TV and film writing. I would like, you know, the old show MASH, if you ever oh, watched yeah. MASH. Oh, yeah. I just remember thinking, it's so funny. MASH and the animated series Star Blazers. Oh, yeah which is based, of course, on space battleship y Yamato or Yamato. I remember seeing those shows and going, I was, you know, I was eight years old or whatever, but I was like, this is three-dimensional characterization. This is, this is well-rounded storytelling and deeper characterization than I've ever seen before. And I was so impressed with it. And the common thread between MASH and Star Blazers and Space Battleship Yamato was that even the villains had deep characterization in the writing. The shows allowed you to empathize a little bit with the villains and show you then that even the heroes could be jerks on a bad day. Even the heroes had darker sides to themselves. And I remember going, that kind of blew my mind. And I'm sure that I saw it in books too, but a lot of the books I read as a kid you know, we're much more black and white. You know, there's super villains and super evil characters. I remember I read a lot of the uh, the Michael Moorcock Elric series as a kid. Oh, yeah. And certainly that had some darker levels of depth as far as Elric is. He's a, quote, good guy, but he's got this sword that's constantly stealing souls and, you know, a dark power in the sword. I remember just being very, very impressed with storytelling that I felt was uh, powerful and moving because it had a more three-dimensional way to depict characters. As far as language, I've always been a big reader. I've been fascinated with words and storytelling. I used to write my own short stories, you know, written short stories, prose short stories as a kid. But I was always very, very interested in writing stories, character, and storytelling. Yeah, that's an interesting experience. I, I don't, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure that there was one specific experience, but I was always a big words and a big reading person. You know, like I would keep a list of, I read 18 books over the summer, yeah, but I, I, was a, I was a voracious reader. I know this is a harder question, but top three books that you can always go back to and reread without getting bored. Wow. Um, it's been a while for prose books that I would reread. I, I, I love reading prose books, but I have to admit that usually once I've read them once, I haven't read them again. 
in a long time. There's actually, wait a minute. There is a prose book that I do reread every once in a while. And it's a very weird one. It's by an author named Italo Calvino. I was an English major. So it's kind of like a very snooty literary. Um, he's kind of like a magical realist, almost like um, not Gabriel Garcia Marquez. There's another magical realist who's very famous uh, in the literary world. But Italo Calvino wrote a fascinating book called If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler. When I say magical realism, it's almost a little bit like not science fiction, but some fantasy elements thrown in, but it's very literary. But this book called If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler, it's told in the, in the second person like a choose your own adventure book. So the book, each chapter is a different sort of world you will visit. The chapter says, you're in this, you're doing this. Now you do this. Over there is this. Over there is that. There's also another Italo Calvino book called Invisible Cities, which every chapter is a different world or realm. They're bordering on fantasy, much like Elric of Melnibone or Michael Moorcock is fantasy. That's a book that is really cool. And I make sure that whenever I've moved apartments or houses, that book is one of a small select <laughs> group of prose books that always comes with me. As far as graphic novels, that's an easier question off the top of my head. Daredevil Born Again is a masterpiece on so many levels in the writing and the illustration. Daredevil Born Again, Batman Year One, Miller and Mazzuccelli, you cannot go wrong. Those are complete masterpieces. I will read them and I will reread them very frequently. Those are huge, huge books. Another book that's uh, pretty powerful, which I think you mentioned a while ago, is Persepolis. Persepolis is kind of like mouse, deep social issues. It's about a woman who left Iran, the height of their conservative, religious, extreme revolution. It was made into an animated film, which is really wonderful. Mouse, obviously, is another masterpiece that I'll read every couple of years. But in the superhero world, Batman Year One, Daredevil Born Again, I actually bought the artist edition of Ooh. Born Again. Mammoth things that are like 18 by 24. Yeah. And you look at the art and you're just like, oh my God, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's hard, especially for someone as well read to choose their favorite. It's like choosing, you know, your favorite child if you have one. Yes, but that's a, you know, it's a good reminder too. I love comics, but I do love reading book books. Uh, you know, I was like, all of, like you said, our free time is limited. We're, we're working, we're doing other things. We're spending time with friends or family, but it's a good reminder. It's a good challenge. I'm going to look back in my, in my bookcase, Kurt, and I'm going to find a prose book, not only comics, because I got a lot of those, <laughs> but it would be fun to find a prose book from my earlier years. Give it a reread. Daredevil Born Again is becoming series as well, too. Yes, it is. I mean, with the original characters. You can't go wrong with Charlie Cox and, and um, Vincent. Uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Thank you. Can't wait for that whenever that comes out. Yes. Although I, I remind people, and I, I'm pretty easy to please as an audience member for the Marvel stuff. Uh, I know that some of it is better than others occasionally, but I remind people it's not going to be a literal adaptation. You know what I mean? They're going to, I think it's like 16 episodes. It's one of the longest Marvel series that's ever been done. Usually they're never as long as 16 episodes. But people have to keep in mind that it's not going to be a literal adaptation. It's probably going to be a thematic adaptation, which probably will involve some of the key plot points, like Kingpin finds out Daredevil's identity and destroys his life. One of the things that most of the Marvel screenwriters, I think, have been able to do pretty well over the years, take the key plot points from the comics and then embellish and add on to them. Very often they'll come up with plot points that aren't in the comics at all, but hopefully most of them, you watch it as an audience member and you think, well, that's a good idea. I wonder why they never did that idea in the comics. And there may be some things where we go, oh no, I can't believe they did that, you know? <laughs> but hey, the fact that they're tackling Born Again at all, and they know the bar has gotta be pretty high, right? As far as the writing and the execution. They know that Born Again means a lot to the audience. I have high hopes for what they do. And they're filming it here in New York City. They filmed the original Daredevil series uh, in the New York City area as well. Actually, they filmed a lot of it in Greenpoint when I lived there. <laughs> and in Williamsburg, uh, the bar that became the, the bar where the characters would all hang out is a bar that I went to frequently in Williamsburg. And, uh, you know, the bar made extra money, you know, for a couple of months. Uh, they were 
taken over by Daredevil, and then they would go back to being a regular bar. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever like sneak in and get in like a little cameo behind the scenes on any of those episodes? You know? Never did, though. They, they block it off pretty yeah. carefully. But that bar, by the way, is called the Turkey's Nest. And I illustrated the Turkey's Nest in the first Greenpoint story that I wrote and illustrated. <laughs> so this bar right up here, yep. the Turkey's Nest, that is the bar that was used in the seasons of Daredevil, the Netflix show. It's right there with the little fat turkeys in the <laughs> logo. There's a little connection between my book and the Daredevil Netflix series. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in either your comic creating or acting careers? Okay, well, the first advice I'll say, and then I'll say the second, Steve Martin, often a, a writer, comedian, and actor I admire a lot. He often gets asked, you know, um, what, what, you know, young actors, young writers, comedians, what should I do, Steve? Give me advice, give me advice. And he had several pieces of advice. And I think one of these came from a friend who's, a friend of a friend saw him at a bar years ago. And Steve Martin said, write your own work. If you're an actor or obviously a comics creator in our case, he said, write your own work, because shortly after his run of great movies in the 80s, he had trouble getting cast. He had trouble getting work. And he saw this guy at a bar. He started writing his own films. Uh, one is called Roxanne, mm -hmm. which is the Cyrano de Bergerac story. One is called L.A. Story, yeah. which is one of my favorite oddball movies. It's kind of a weird rom-com. Look at me. He said, I'm Steve Martin. You recognize me on site. You know who I am. I had movies in the 80s, but I haven't been getting parts in the last several years, even though I'm, you know, a celebrity or whatever. He said, so I had to start writing my own work because it's way too easy to get typecast and be that guy from 20 years ago. Other friends encouraged me to write my own stuff. I really didn't see myself as a writer and I had to push myself to start writing my own stuff. Write your own work if you're an illustrator, if you're an actor. We have so many actors now writing their own short films. The second piece of advice, Steve Martin would always say, be so good that they can't ignore you. Try to be the best at what you do or one of the best because then it's statistically less of a chance that You'll be ignored with the thousands of others who are also creators, actors, writers, illustrators doing that. Really try to stand out. The other thing is by James Baldwin, one of the more prominent black writers, social commentators in the 1960s. James Baldwin said, this is not a verbatim quote, but the quote is something like, talent, yes. Skill, yes. He said, I know a lot of talented writers, but I also know a lot of talented ruins. He said, above all, persistence. And as an actor, believe me, I've been in this field of acting 25 years. I just went to final callbacks for a role opposite Sarah Jessica Parker in the new Sex in the City thing. Went to final, final callbacks. Then they put me on hold. Okay, put on hold means it's between you and like one other, two other actors. You know, and this is not extra work. This is for real, you know, speaking roles with several lines. And, and I didn't get it. It's 23 years of doing theater, film, whatever. Persistence. If you really believe in yourself and you think you have something to offer. Look, I think I have something to offer. Do I think I'm some genius? No. But I want to be in the game and I think I'm competitive. I think I have something special to offer. I know in the same sentence, there's thousands of other actors. There's thousands of other. There's so many brilliant cartoonists and writers and illustrators out there. I'm not saying I'm any better than them. I just want to bring my own unique voice to the table. And I think I have something to offer. Persistence. There's a lot of talented people out there, but a lot of those people let themselves get sidetracked. Either they give up because life gets too busy or they destroy themselves with various addictions or drugs, alcohol, whatever. That's a bit of a cliche about writers. Um, not to say that we shouldn't drink or we shouldn't occasionally indulge in whatever. There's so many ways for creative people to sidetrack themselves. I often was told when I started as an actor and even in comics, if you haven't made it in five years, give up. Give yourself five years and then leave. And I think that's so self-defeating. I've been at this acting 24 years, comics 14 years. If you really want to do it professionally, Stay in the game, hustle, make sure you're putting out product as much as you can with also without driving yourself insane, feeling like you have to be some workhorse, constantly showing people that you made something. Persistence. There's a lot of talent out there, but a lot of talented people give up. 
And a lot of talented people let themselves get sidetracked. You never, never know. With this book, I'm an indie creator. Bill Sienkiewicz gave me a cover quote for this book because I stayed in the game, followed him. I made an acquaintanceship with him over the years. I would see him at comics conventions and I would tag him occasionally. I try not to be overly tagging everyone because that could be annoying too on social media. But eventually he took an interest in my work. We're acquaintances, friendly on some vague way. You know, he writes on my Facebook page occasionally about my family or whatever. He's trying to pay it forward. He's trying to give some encouragement to creators, younger creators. Well, oh, hey, this kid over here is doing something. That's okay. He's doing something kind of interesting. Give him some encouragement. You know, Derek Robertson, the co-creator of The Boys, gave me my cover quote for this book. Bill Sankevich is on the cover. Dean Haspiel gave me a, a quote. Whether I get somewhere huge, big or not, having creators who I really respect and admire take the time and effort to give me a quote for my book saying, I like what this kid over here is doing. Check this book out. That means the world to me. And that gives me enough encouragement to stay in the game further, even though I was already going to stay in the game anyway, because I don't want to give up. I think really trying to hold yourself to high standards, that's the Steve Martin, be so good they can't ignore you. Because we know how easy it is to get ignored, lost in the shuffle and social media, right? You've talked extensively and we've all banged our head against the walls. Social media, promotion, how do you promote yourself? All we can do is try to be strategic, like you're your own PR agency. You've spoken to that so many times, Kurt, right? I've been saying more recently, you're one voice out of 8 billion. Yes. To keep at it, keep doing what you can do. And someone will see your work, whether you're shadow banned or not. You know, as long as you can touch one person's life, that's all that truly matters. Yes, it really is. It's like they say about teachers, right? If you're a teacher, if you if you reach two or three students, that's huge. And I want to give you great props and great respect, Kurt, because you have been doing this podcast now for over 15 years, correct? 15 years. It's uh, it's more of a show than a podcast these days, but I, yes. you know, I'm trying to get into both avenues back again. And, you know, as long as uh, some creator that I bring on, whether it's yourself or someone else down the road or in the past that they happen to go through the archive, and if they've inspired them in some way, then, then that's awesome. I'm glad that I've at least done something for someone. Yeah. And you interviewed several times Phil Foglio. Yeah who I used to read in the pages of Dragon Magazine because I was a Dungeons and Dragons kid sure. and I got Dragon Magazine and that's, and then I traced his career, you know, as he began to do some work for DC and other works, the near myths adaptations he did. It's just, it's so cool. And then eventually, like you've experienced, you realize you can meet these people and become friendly with them. Although they're creators we admire, they're also just people. And they have lives and they have families and they do interviews. And it's great that a lot of them, they don't get too big to be inaccessible to shows like ours or, or you know, to anything. I really think that's special when you see a lot of uh, shows and someone who's very prominent will, will do interviews on all kinds of shows. I think that's very important for them not only to do the interviews on the hugest shows and then never talk to anyone else. That leads into my, my documentary I've been putting together for the last uh, you know 12 years or so called Little Person Amongst Media Giants. It was because of situations like that, that I was, okay. when I was rejected by a bunch of people that I wanted to, to talk to, not out of spite or anything. It was just, they didn't seem like a little right. show like what I was putting together was worth talking to. And so my goal was to interview Stan Lee and that didn't happen, but I interviewed talented and creative people like yourself with the same exact same four questions I was going to ask him. So going back into my archive, looking at it yourself, seeing interviews and people that you know yeah, in the past, absolutely. that brings a tear to my eye and, and keeps me motivated to keep going. So I do greatly appreciate that, Tony. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Ooh, that's a good question. One person. Well, I would honestly say my parents. It's a bit of a cliche. I, I would imagine it's two people. My parents, they gave me so much encouragement. They took me seriously. And my mother in particular saved so much of my childhood artwork, always encouraged when I was writing, when I was drawing. She thought I 
had a little ability. My my older brother, by the way, is a really good illustrator, and he kind of let it go by the wayside. You know, he occasionally will draw something for his kids or his family, but he was way better than me. Uh, he was really, really skilled as a teenager. He was far better at 16 or 17 than I was at 16 or 17. So I felt pretty certain I probably started drawing to emulate him. But my mother, she encouraged me to always date every drawing I did, even when I was in elementary school, uh, because she thought someday it might be relevant. <laughs> so, uh, of course, we imagine that our parents, you know, or many of our parents might be like, my kid is special, you know, and we can chuckle about that. But she saved so much of my original art and always was so encouraging with my writing, my artwork and my creative stuff. And she always said, someday, I think you're going to, you're going to do a book and you're going to do more than one book. Although it's not with, you know, Marvel or DC at the moment, I have at least a book. One of my life's goals was to get all these stories into a physical paperback. It's pretty thick. As you said, it's a little over 200 pages. I'm just so thankful to have a book at all. But I think I would really have to say, first and foremost, my parents, because I really received that encouragement for all of my art. I used to write and draw my own comics, and my dad, uh, my dad would go to his office and I would say, please Xerox this comic, give me 15 copies, and staple it at the edges, like a comic. His secretary or his office workers would be very amused, and he'd come home with 15 copies, and I would give them out to friends at my junior high school and my high school. And I felt like, ooh, I was pub you know, published in some way. I was printing my own comics. There were so many influences. But first and foremost, my parents you know, uh, gave me a lot of encouragement and saved so much of my art. In the back of this book, I put a back matter section in. I, I really love it when graphic novel collections, any books, put in behind the scenes, production drawings, early sketches by the artists. And I was determined to put a back matter section in this book. And I also was determined to throw in some childhood artwork. Wow. And this would not exist. This, that's a, that's a, an homage to, I think, a George Tusca or John Buscema Hulk cover yeah. from the 70s or 80s. I did this when I was around nine years old, I think. So even then, I was doing homage covers and studies of the masters. Uh, the Six Million Dollar Man, some Micronauts toys. <laughs> um, and I have a little, oh, that's that's a Jack Kirby. Yep. Uh, Fantastic Four, you know that cover, right? I know that one, yeah. uh, early Silver Surfer appearance. If my parents hadn't saved this, there's some R2-D2. <laughs> I did a Darth Vader kite. Like, I was a weird kid. Who did a kite of Darth Vader? In any case, I'm just thrilled to have a book. And I'm thrilled that my parents uh, encouraged me so much. From a professional standpoint, you have been in the acting industry for 24 years. You've been in the comic industry as well for 16. And you're going to be amazing in white well, sorry, You're not going to be. You are already well, thanks. in both of I'm, I'm aspiring towards more and more. <laughs> I think that's what you were... I take exactly. it kindly. That's where you were going. You <laughs> that, that's where I was going. So professionally, you're successful in, in many different industries and regards. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you. And thank you for the, for the kind words. You know, it's funny. My, my wife and my friends would tell you that we creative artist people, you know, we can sometimes obsess about, am I successful? What degree have I achieved? Am I at the, you know, I feel I'm very successful with what I've had to work with, with where I've gone so far. I still have a lot of ambition and aspire to a greater level of professional success. I would like more professional acting work more frequently. I would like uh, to achieve some greater levels of exposure and success in the comics world. And so I think for, for all artists, it's a weird paradox, right? You want to be proud of what you've accomplished, but you also don't want to rest on your laurels and you want to aspire to achieve more things. I would certainly eventually like to graduate from the day job, the office job that I have that's thankfully sustained me all these years. <laughs> I work at a law firm in Manhattan and they've been very kind and supportive, as has my wife consistently. And I'm very thankful for that. On the same token, we are uh, hungry, hungry hippos. We're hungry for more. And for mental health, as we all know, that can be a tricky thing. You don't want to only obsess what's next, climb the mountain, climb the mountain. 
because then you might feel like you haven't achieved much of anything with what you've achieved up till now. So it's a very delicate paradox. It's a balance. I'm very proud and thankful. One of my goals was to get a book done by the time I turned 50. Well, the book happened when I was 51. I'm 51 now. I was born in 1971. At the very least, you know, God forbid, if cancel, cancel. If I don't make it, you know, if a couple, you know, months from now, I'm no longer here. At least there is a book that contains my output. Everything I did pretty much. However, I've done a, a you know a fair amount of professional acting work, theater and film. I was on The Blacklist. I was on Marvelous Mrs. Maisel last year. I've been on Comedy Central in a sketch. I've done hundreds of sketch comedy videos with, with actor friends, writer friends, comedians. I've done a lot of voiceover work, but I'm also aiming to do a lot more so that it's not just a few gigs a year and coming very close to HBO, Netflix, guest star, co-stars. I would like to do a lot more. However... Given the background that I've had, given the luck that I've had up till now, because some of it is luck, you know, there's so many good actors out there. There's so many good illustrators out there, voiceover people. There's so many people that are very skilled and very competitive. I'm very thankful for what I've achieved, but I'd also like to achieve a whole lot more. So that's what, that's what fuels me. Like you said, Kurt, you know, you get encouragement, we get enough encouragement, but also even beyond encouragement, if we believe in ourselves and we have that fire in the belly, as the saying goes, I'm going to keep going until I die. I'm keeping going until I croak. Whether success at a higher level comes in nine years, three years, next month, 12 years, I have a job, right? I have a, I have a day job. I'm definitely going to keep churning out comics until I die. And I'm going to keep going on the auditions until I die. I believe there's bigger things ahead. One of my personal goals, I, I want to host the Oscars. And I want to host the Tony Awards. I honestly believe that I could do that very well. I could do it next month. But realistically, I need to have a few hit movies under my belt in order to get to host the Tony Awards or the Oscars. And I, I believe I can get there. Looking at the small victories. When someone says to me, well, you've been doing this for 15 years, it does that doesn't even register. It's just, it's right. it's a number <clears throat> at this point, but it's... It's the journey that I then have to think back on what exactly I have accomplished. And it's a lot more than I, I even realized. So when I did yes. the 15th anniversary show, it was like, yeah, I've been doing this for 15 years. I didn't, it didn't register until I saw the number. So, yes. And the other thing, which is a bit of a cliche, but is also true. Very few people go from level six to level 30, right? It's usually little drips and drabs bit by bit bit by bit. And, you know, for me, I had five lines on Comedy Central two years ago. I had one line on Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I had two lines on this. It's a lot of little small things. But eventually, after six years, people are like, oh, Comedy Central, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Blacklist, this, that, and the other thing, HBO coming up, you know, all these little... And then it's funny, it can be like seven years of frustration of small things. But then, you know, something comes and people are like, oh, look at all the things on that resume. With the comics, I, I used to be a guy with two stories under my belt. And now I've got quotes from Bill Sienkiewicz, Derek Robertson, Dean Haspiel, my friend Brendan Denine, two New Yorker cartoonists. I start to make relationships with smaller websites, medium websites. Guess what? Four years later, those small and medium websites are a lot bigger because they've grown also. And you were in with them on the ground floor. You never know where people can go. And Kurt, I'll make you a promise. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, although it might sound grandiose, if I ever get to be a very successful actor, I'm coming back on your show multiple times because, you know, we never forget. We never forget where we came from. And if I don't, I'll still come back multiple times because <laughs> you're a gentleman and you're very kind, Kurt. And I, you, you do a lot to promote artists at all levels. You do a lot to promote creators and people like me, we appreciate that. No, I, I appreciate the words. It's uh, I don't hear it that often because I'm in my own bubble, but it's a fun journey so far and I want to keep doing it until I croak. So I'm going to be the same way. Whether yeah. I become successful yeah. or not, I'll, uh, I'll keep doing this. And if there's someone that finds something interesting, I've done my jobs. And I think there's a, there's something to be interesting to be found in all interviews, in all your interviews, you know, mm -hmm. whoever the person is, whatever the, whatever the situation is.
Well, we, uh, <laughs> we'll figure something out. I, I think I found a format that works. So the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? That's a very good question and very important. I've read so much literature on achieving and success and, you know, that's a whole like genre in and of itself, right? There's a whole subgenre of like success literature and inspirational literature. Having lived 50 years, 51 years, failure is just as important. We need failures. I, I study the work of artists, actors, writers, directors. If you're inspired to do something, you got to swing the bat. You got to take that swing. And if it fails, if it doesn't resonate with an audience, if no one cares, so be it. We have to take the lessons from failure. And even when we make mistakes, we, you can make mistakes. We can, you know, have differences with people. Uh, the important thing is to apologize, take uh, responsibility, take accountability. But in terms of creative mistakes or artistic failures, you got to write that story you're inspired to make. Bendis always said, make the book you'd want to read on the shelves. If you were a stranger and you didn't write that book, right? You're removed. Make the book you'd want to read as a reader. Do the acting performance you'd want to watch as an outside actor. We see constant accounts from successful creative people. Failures are important. We learn from the failures. But if you're excited about the idea, you got to execute the idea. And also finished is better than perfect. And for illustrators and writers, that's so, so important. A lot of these stories, I now have, you know, 22 short stories. If I obsessed and never finished them, they would be like an unfinished screenplay in the drawer that no one ever sees, that movie never gets made. Failure is important. Go down swinging if you have to. You've got to take the shot. And then learn from whatever the lessons you feel it was. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, artist, creative person in that regard, or maybe as an actor. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? It may sound cliche, but, you know, being true to themselves. One thing I try to do that I think a lot of, obviously, younger creators are doing, use your voice, use your personal experiences, issues that matter to you, topics <clears throat> that matter to you and resonate with you. Things in your psyche and your life, things that your friends are going through, things that your family is going through or might be going through, use those in your creative work. Most of the best creative work comes from personal inspiration, and that usually comes from life experience, topics, ideas, things that resonate with you. Make sure that when you put your work out there, it's your voice and things you are passionate about. I think the younger generation probably doesn't need to hear that from, from me because they're already doing it themselves. We as creatives, we as artists, we have the most impact when the stuff is really coming from the heart we're very deeply passionate about. And it goes back to an earlier thing, the work you would be doing, whether it was successful or not. <clears throat> if your life was a comic book or a movie, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Ooh, good question. Title, uh... Given what I just talked about earlier, I would have the title be Go Down Swinging, meaning take those swings, take the shot. The title might sound negative as a title, but I just mean the spirit of indomitable persistence. Look, we have one life. We have 24 hours. Neil Gaiman famously said through his character Death, you get what everyone gets. You get a lifetime. And I think Neil Gaiman has also said about writers and creative works, you get 24 hours, just like everyone else. The famous successful people have 24 hours. The struggling artists have 24 hours. We all have 24 hours. Time is so precious. And the older we get, right, Kurt? We realize our time is precious. I'm far less likely to whittle away five hours messing around. I know that I want to get these drawings done. If I want to get these stories told, I got to crank out the work. It's a balance between being a workhorse, obsessed, workaholic. You also need to allow yourself some peace of mind and some free time. And the soundtrack would be Eye of the Tiger from Rocky Three. <laughs> Just got to stay hungry, find inspiration in, in our lives, and uh, hopefully in our work. Make stuff that expresses who you are and get it made and get it out to the world and then let the world evaluate it. Well, Tony, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks <laughs> Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Kurt. I really appreciate it. Again, 
we connect with a lot of people on social media, right? Some are acquaintances, some are friends, but I really, it means a lot to me. There's many people, right? You have those people. I have those people. Everyone watching has those people. Someone who's kept up with you over the years and really cares and says, wow, I'm interested in what that person is doing. And and the persistence and the extension of the friendship or acquaintanceship at whatever level, it's meaningful. It's human connection. You know, Twitter can be, as we all know, such a dumpster fire of negativity and hatred. It means all the more to have kind, supportive people in the arts and fans. I got on Twitter because I wanted to talk comics with people. You know, we're fans, we're enthusiasts. That's when social media, I think, is at its most fulfilling, where fans talk about stuff we love. So thank you. Thank you for your voice and for doing all that you do. Before I let you go, because <laughs> we could talk for hours, yeah, yeah. where can we find you? How can we support you? Where's the comic that you have amazingly created and anything else you'd like to promote? Well, thank you. Yeah, sure. So I'm on social media. Uh, you've got it here in your your beautiful banner that you made with the colors from uh, Sir Griffin, Thomas Griffin, who's colored so much of my stuff in the past. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Tony Wolfness. It's just Tony Wolf, N-E-S-S, because the essence of me is my Tony Wolfness. My website is www.tonywolfactor.com, although it does include and will continue to include some of my comics and artwork. The book, Tales from the Wolf, which is totally a Tales from the Crypt inspired title. And we did our EC Comics homage title, Tales from the Crypt, is available only from Cosmic Lion Productions. Eli Schwab is the publisher. He's a gentleman, a kind man, and a scholar, and really supports artists and creatives of all types. CosmicLionProductions.com to purchase the book. The book is also available. A few copies are uh, floating around at Desert Island Comics in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, at St. Mark's Comics in downtown Brooklyn, Industry City. And let's see, there might be some copies floating around a few other places as well. CosmicLionProductions.com. That is the place to buy the book. We don't have it through Amazon because we wanted to give all of the proceeds to the publisher who took the risk on this and spent, you know, thousands of dollars giving me a print run. We're also about to do a second print run. The second print run, which is essentially the same book, cleaning up a few little things. And it'll have a new logo, by the way, designed by Sam J. Royale. The new CLP, Cosmic Lions Productions logo. Sam J. Royale is a brilliant designer and illustrator. And we're so thankful to have his new logo on the second printing of my book. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, <laughs> tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word to, not the number two, because that goes to a completely different website, not mine. Okay. Website's going through a revamp, so go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years because reasons. And, of course, you can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, whatever else you get your podcasts on. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.